Hello and welcome to lecture 10 of module 2 of this course on accelerator physics. Uh, today we will learn about transverse dynamics of beams with space charge. But before that let's just quickly revise what we <coughs> learned in the previous lecture. So we studied that the quadrupoles of reverse polarities are used in pairs for focusing the beam because we have seen that quadrupoles focus in one direction and defocus in the other direction. So they are used in pairs for focusing the beam. Different types of focusing lattices like photo, fofododo, solenoids, etc. These are used for focusing the beam in Linux. So yesterday we saw that in inside the drift tube Linux there are drift tubes and in these drift tubes quadrupole magnets are put for focusing the beam. They could be arranged in any configuration like photo, fofododo or even a fofofododo configuration. For a periodic focusing system, the general equation of any particle is an ellipse. So, we derived this in the previous lecture. At a given location s in trace space xx prime, each particle will lie on the ellipse defined by the twist parameters alpha, beta and gamma. The twist parameters are the same for all parameters that is ellipses for all the particles are concentric. So alpha, beta, gamma tell you about the shape and orientation of the ellipse. They tell you about the uh, beam properties, the beam size, the beam divergence, whether the beam is diverging or converging and so on. The area of each ellipse depends upon the value of the constant of motion which is epsilon i for that particle. The outermost ellipse defines the maximum beam size and the maximum beam divergence. The beam emittance is defined as the area of the outermost ellipse divided by pi. We also saw that the single particle behavior can be studied by solving the Hill's equation which is a single particle equation. So it includes the force due to the quadrupole magnet or whatever the case may be, whatever element is there. We can also study the single particle behavior by the transfer matrix method. So if we know the uh, transfer matrix of the element and we know the initial coordinates of the particle before the uh, elements then we can find out the final coordinates of the uh, particle at the end of that element. The behavior of the beam envelope can be studied by solving the envelope equation which we derived in the previous lecture or by sigma matrix method. So sigma matrices are basically in terms of the twist parameters alpha, beta and gamma. So they give you the entire information about the beam at a particular location. So if you know the uh, sigma matrix at the initial location and you know the transfer matrix uh, for the element in between, you can find out the final sigma matrix and uh, uh, hence the uh, beam size, beam divergence at the end of that element. <clears throat> now in all this analysis we have studied the effect of only external elements like quadrupoles uh, etc on the beam. We have not studied the effect of uh, the force due to the beam itself. So if the beam is a high current beam, so there will be many particles of the same charge in the beam. And these particles being of the same charge will tend to uh, repel each other because of which there will be a repulsive force uh, acting on the particles due to the beam itself. So this is known as the space charge force and today we will study about the transverse beam dynamics including the space charge forces. So this is particularly important for high intensity beams and high intensity beams are required for several applications. One is the accelerator driven system. So we, uh, I discussed about this in the first lecture. So we need uh, a high current beam here. Another application is Pelletian neutron sources. Here also uh, a high intensity beam hits a target and Pelletian neutrons are produced which are used for doing experiments. So in order to have a high yield of neutron, we should have a high current proton beam. So both of these applications require a very high intensity beams. So high intensity beams are high current beams and since the beam current is high and particles in the beam are of the same charge, 
they will experience coulombic repulsion this results in degradation of the beam quality so the beam emittance will increase increase in beam size resulting in beam loss so since these forces are repulsive the beam size tends to increase and if the beam hits the uh, aperture beam will be lost beam loss at high energies can result in activation of the accelerating structures preventing hands on maintenance of the accelerator now if beam is lost at higher energies <coughs> this can activate the structure so that uh, during operation uh, nobody is allowed to enter the uh, beam the accelerator tunnel but after the uh, accelerator is uh, shut down people enter inside to uh, for maintaining the structure so if there is beam loss at higher energies this can activate the accelerating structure so that it can become radioactive and even after the beam is shut down the accelerator is shut down people will not be able to enter inside for hands on maintenance of the structure so uh, beam loss at higher energies is undesirable so the force due to the beam self charge is known as space charge force now in order to understand the uh, space charge force in high intensity beams let us consider a very simple model Uh, let us consider a, a cylindrical uniform beam so let's say we have a cylindrical uniform beam with circular cross section the beam current here is i the beam radius is a and the beam is moving with a velocity v so due to symmetry the electric field here will be in the radial direction so we will have an electric field which is in the radial direction and a magnetic field which is in the azimuthal direction so there will be only two components uh, of electric field and magnetic field here rho is the uh, charge density and uh, j is the current density so the electric field the radial component of electric field can be calculated so we know that from maxwell's equation divergence of e is equal to rho by epsilon 0 applying gauss's law we can write the volume integral of uh, divergence of e is equal to the surface integral of e dot ds so applying this over a cylinder of radius r and length l we get this expression and by simplifying this further we get the radial component of electric field as this expression so we see that it depends upon the beam current higher the beam current higher is the uh radial component of electric field it depends upon r the distance from the center and also on the beam size similarly we can calculate the magnetic field due to this uh, cylindrical uniform beam with circular cross section so there will be only theta component of magnetic field so again using maxwell's equation curl of b is equal to mu 0 j and applying the stokes theorem we can write b r d theta is equal to uh, integral of this is equal to curl of b dot da so applying this over a cross section of radius r we get b theta 2 pi r is equal to mu 0 r square pi beta c rho again simplifying this we get b theta is equal to i by 2 pi epsilon 0 c square r by a square <clears throat> now force acting on a charged particle due to this uh, uniform cylinder so we can calculate using lorentz force so the force in the radial direction will be q e r minus v z into b theta so we have already calculated the e r and b theta values if we substitute in the lorentz force we get this expression so and if we simplify this we get this expression for the force acting on any charged particle due to this uniform uh, cylindrical charge of cross sec uh, uniform cross section so here we see that the uh, there are two components to this force one is due to the electric field the other is due to the magnetic field the component of force due to the electric field is repulsive and due to the magnetic field is attractive you can see here because there is a minus sign here so it is attractive whereas the component due to the electric field is repulsive 
so we all and we can also see that the force is linear in r so the force is linear in r and the coulomb effects in linux are most important in non relativistic beam at low velocities so as the beam becomes relativistic and beta approaches 1 so the magnetic field the force due to the magnetic field will cancel the coulombic repulsion due to the electric field so the coulomb effects or the space charge effects are more important at lower energies for high current beams for relativistic beam the self magnetic forces increase and produce partial cancellation of the electric coulomb forces so uh, at higher energies or let's say for electrons because we know for electrons the beam becomes relativistic at lower values of uh, kinetic energy the space charge forces are not so important they are more important for uh, high current beams ion beams uh, at lower energies so moving charges here they produce mutually repulsive electric field and attractive magnetic field now we have calculated for a uniform uh, charge distribution now if we calculate for a non uniform charge distribution let's consider a gaussian beam distribution for a circular cross section so the charge density is given by this expression so again uh, using uh, maxwell's equation so divergence of e is equal to rho by epsilon 0 now rho we substitute the distribution the gaussian distribution here and we can calculate the force in the radial direction using q e r by gamma square as we have calculated uh, previously so we get this expression now here notice that for a non uniform gaussian beam the space charge radial force is no longer radial in r so this is a non linear force now so the force depends upon the distribution the type of distribution for a uniform charge distribution it is linear for a non uniform distribution like a gaussian distribution it is non linear so this is a uniformly distributed beam in uh, real space in x and y so this is x and this is y and here we see that the force is linear in r this is a gaussian distributed beam so that the charge density is high at the center and uh, falling as the radius increases so for a gaussian distributed beam the force is non linear <coughs> so we can summarize uh, the result here the coulomb effects in linux are usually most important in non relativistic beams at low velocities because for relativistic beams the self magnetic force forces increase and produce partial cancellation of the coulombic forces so they are important at lower energies only the net effect of the coulomb interaction in a multi particle system can be separated into two contributions so one is the space charge field the result of combining the fields from all the particles to produce a smoothed field field distribution which varies appreciably over distances that are large compared with the average separation of the particles so this is what we have just calculated the effect of the entire charge distribution on a single particle then the second is the contribution arising from the particulate nature of the beam which include short range fields describing binary small impact coulomb collision so between adjacent particles there are coulomb coulombic collisions so these are short range forces so typically the particles in the linac bunch exceed 10 to the power of 8 particles there are large number of particles in a bunch and the effect of the collisions are very sm small as compared to the effects of average space charge field so uh, we usually uh, consider the force on the charge particle due to the uh, entire beam distribution the force due to the coulombic uh, repulsion of uh, adjacent particles this is short range and usually very small and can be ignored now let's see how the beam can be described every particle in the beam can be described by three position and three momentum coordinate so we usually talk of the beam in phase space so we uh, so each particle can be described by three position and three momentum coordinates then each particle is represented by a single point in the six dimensional phase space of coordinates and momenta 
in practice it is convenient to work with two dimensional phase space projection so even though we are describing the beam in six dimensional uh, phase space so we take projections uh, in two dimensional phase spaces and we work with them so we normalized phase space projections are x and uh, px by mc y and py by mc z and pz by mc so x y z are the coordinates and px py and pz are the momentum components now instead of uh, transverse momenta it is convenient to measure the divergence angle so we have already seen in the previous lectures that uh, it is uh, convenient to work in trace space x and x prime rather than x and px so we take the divergence angle dx by ds which is same thing as x prime dy by ds which is same thing as y prime so plots of x prime and x x prime and y y prime are known as trace space or unnormalized phase space projection so you can see here this is the projection in x x prime this is a projection of the beam in y y prime this is in real space x and y and this is in the z direction in terms of phase and energy so in longitudinal phase space position and momentum relative to the synchronous particle can be used but more often these are replaced by phase and energy phi and w so you can see here this uh, in z direction uh, instead of z z prime we have used phase and energy and this is with respect to the synchronous particle the beam phase space contours in a linac have the approximate shape of an ellipse so we have derived this in the previous lecture we saw that whenever there are linear forces the uh, beam uh, or any charged particle in phase space travels in a elliptical path so this is due to the predominance of linear focusing forces quadrupoles the focusing uh, force due to a quadrupole is linear in most accelerators with linear focusing the trajectory of each particle in phase space lies on an ellipse which is called the trajectory ellipse so these are the trajectory ellipses for various particles so each uh, particle has the same twist parameters alpha beta and gamma what differs is the value of the constant of motion which is epsilon i due to the tendency of uh, linac beams to exhibit <coughs> approximately elliptical phase space distributions it is conventional to define for each two dimensional projection a quantity called emittance which is proportional to the area of the chosen beam ellipse so we define an emittance so we saw in the previous lecture that the outermost uh, area of the outermost ellipse divided by pi is known as the emittance so just uh, quickly revising what we have already done the beam phase space contours in a linac have the approximate shape of an ellipse the general equation of the ellipse is uh, given by gamma x square plus 2 alpha x x prime plus beta x prime square is equal to epsilon so here alpha beta gamma are the twist parameters and they are related as gamma is equal to 1 plus alpha square by beta so these twist parameters tell you about the shape and orientation of the ellipse they also tell you about the beam property so uh, the maximum beam size is given by under root beta epsilon this is the maximum beam size this is the beam half width similarly the maximum beam divergence xm prime is equal to under root gamma epsilon so this is this value it is the beam half divergence so the motion of the particles is uh, uh, is along constant hamiltonian and then emittance is defined as the area of the outermost ellipse divided by pi so here emittance corresponds it is it corresponds to the constant of motion of the outermost particle so quality of the beam is qualitative quantitatively described by its emittance so emittance is a figure of merit of the beam which is closely related to the area of the two dimensional projections of the hyper ellipsoidal volume occupied by the particles in six dimensional phase space on x p x y p y and z p z plane so the beam occupies a hyper ellipsoid in the six dimensional phase space x p x y p y z p z so we take projection and emittance is defined for the projection 
in two dimensional phase spaces the transverse emittance is normally expressed in millimeter millirad since x prime and y prime are preferred to px and py so we normally use instead of the phase space the trace space so the uh, emittance is taken in the trace space x x prime so the units are millimeter millirad the longitudinal emittance defined only for bunched beams so if it is a dc beam if the beam is not bunched then the beam is continuous in the z direction so uh, the uh, emittance is not defined in the z direction the longitudinal emittance is defined only for bunched beams this is normally expressed in nanosecond kv or degree kv in many cases an ellipse can uh, roughly approximate the emittance boundary sometimes beams do not have uh, uh, proper elliptical boundaries so the area of such an ellipse represents the full emittance of the beam in that plane and its size is determined by the outermost particle of the distribution so whenever there are linear forces the trajectories of the particles in phase space they lie on an ellipse but if there are non linear forces the uh, particles can lie outside the ellipse so you can still use an ellipse to roughly approximate the emittance boundary and then in this case area of such an ellipse represents the full emittance of the beam in that plane and its size is determined by the outermost particle of the distribution but sometimes it can happen that uh, let's say some very few particles can go far away from the main beam so here as you can see in this picture so this is taken from uh, uh, the uh, a code called trace fin so you can see here most of the beam is in the central region but a few particles have now uh, are far away from the central core of the beam so if non linear forces are present then projections of the phase space of a real beam may have complex shape and poorly defined boundary a few particles may go very distant from the beam core and form halo so this is what is known as the beam halo so if you calculate the emittance the containing all the particles this value will come out to be very large so in such cases the emittance can be defined as 1 by pi times the area delimited by an iso density contour containing some large fraction of the particles so you can define a 90% emittance or a 99% emittance so you can define an ellipse which contains let's say 90% of the particles or 99% of the particles so uh, and uh, so an ellipse which contains 90% of the particles 99% of the particles and that is called the 90% emittance or 99% emittance so here you can see this for this beam this is the 50% emit, uh, 50% ellipse so the area of this ellipse will be the 50% emittance this is the 90% ellipse so containing the 90% of the particles in the beam so this will be the 90% emittance and this is the ellipse containing 99% of the particles and this will be this will correspond to the 99% emittance so generally beams do not have well defined boundaries so in the presence of non linear forces the uh, beam need not be an elliptical beam so one method for assigning an emittance is to choose a specific density contour in phase space such as at 50% 90% 99% of the maximum density it can be shown that under certain conditions such emittances are conserved for example when liouville's theorem is satisfied in the six dimensional phase space or when forces in the three orthogonal directions that is x y and z they are uncoupled beam distributions now let us talk of beam distributions we've already seen a uniform distribution and a gaussian distribution so beam of charged particles can be conveniently represented by means of a distribution function f of the charge in four dimensional phase space or six dimensional phase space so four dimensional fourier phase space x px y py is generally used when you have a dc beam so you need not define the beam in the z direction so in that case a four dimensional phase space is sufficient to define the beam when you have a bunched beam in that case six dimensional phase space is used x px y py and z pz 
So motion of the particles can be described as that of a set of points in six dimensional phase space. So you can have a distribution function in six dimensional phase space which uh, can be defined like this or in four dimensional phase space as uh, like this f is equal to f which is a function of x p x y p y and in this case for six dimensional phase space x p x y p y z p z. So motion of the center of mass of the beam is described by first moment. So first moments are you can take average over x, average over x prime, y, y prime of the particle distribution f x x prime y y prime which is then defined statistically as so average x average is taking the integral of x multiplied by the distribution function f and uh, taking the integral over dx dx prime dy dy prime here f is normalized to 1 and similarly for the other uh, x x uh, x prime average y y and y prime average. the other important information is contained in the second moment so second moment is uh, defined as average over x square average over x x prime x y x y prime and so on so of the particle distributions which is defined statistically in a similar way so it is defined again just like we have defined the first moment so average of x square is the taking the integral of x minus uh, average x square multiplied by the uh, distribution function f and integrating over dx dx prime dy dy prime. Similarly, the second moment of x x prime it can be defined in this manner and so on for the other eight. <clears throat> the root mean square values of such quantities are defined as XRMS is taken as so you uh, simply take the square root of the uh, second moment and you can define the root mean square or the RMS of such quantities.